Nelson Mandela once said that he learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. And that the brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. And I think our speaker this evening is most definitely an exemplar of that. So it's most definitely my honor to share the stage this evening with Dr. Brown. He's a doctor who not only conquered his fear, but he led others to overcome their fears to care for victims of one of the deadliest disease outbreaks of our time during the Ebola crisis in Western Africa. There really was no precedent for what he did or for what he and his colleagues were able to do in the fight against Ebola during that time. Tonight, Dr. Brown's gonna share his story of how a global health and medical system was unprepared for this outbreak that ended up killing more than 11,000 people in West Africa. And he's gonna share what it took for him and other healthcare professionals to contribute to the stopping of this deadly outbreak or at least halting it from spreading any further. And it is for this great feat that as Dr. Uh, Van Rinsberg said, that he and other Ebola fighters were named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. So here to tell this amazing story is Time Magazine's 2014 Person of the Year, Dr. Jerry Brown. Let me first say thanks to God for being here today. It's by His grace that I've made it here. And uh, I often like to say to God be the glory for all that have been said about me and what people continue to say. Uh, my name has been called, indeed, I'm a native born of Liberia. I was born in central Liberia and belong to the Quela tribe in Liberia. I'm married with three children and I obtained my Bachelor of Science degree in Liberia from the AMWT College of Medicine. The I mean, University of Liberia first right up before going to the AMWT College of Medicine where I became a medical doctor. And then in 2008, I joined the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. It's a group of, uh, where a group of American doctors came together and decided to form this organization to train uh, Africans in, in a profession state of surgery so that they remain back home and cater to their people as much as possible. And I was the first to be chosen from Liberia to join the PACS program. And for five years, I was trained as a general surgeon. In 2013, I graduated with my master in surgery from the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. And there, my desire to serve the Lord even grew stronger, the fact that most of my professors were all Christians. And uh, it was amazing seeing very homo uh, Christian surgeons and working with them. And I just returned in October 2013 without uh, practicing for quite a year. Three months later, I got an appointment as medical director for the EWA hospital in January 2014. A position I initially rejected, but spoke with my program director. He says, surgeons are leaders, so don't leave it. Perhaps God has called you at this, uh, I mean, to occupy that position for a reason. I never knew what was to unfold in the next few months, and so I accepted the job. March, when uh, I was, my probation was lifted, then the Bola came. So the first question was, why did I accept this position? <laughs> That's what I said, why? By the way, I'm in the U.S. today because I was invited by the New Dimension of Hope to give me an honor in uh, Colorado, uh, where a fellow Liberian living in the U.S., I think he's a citizen now, chose to build a school in Liberia to cater to the least 48 children. And I realized my background being similar to them, growing up in a slum, not having any financial support to go to school, and I had to struggle my way up. And so I felt there was a need to form part of this group and see how we could raise funds to help educate other least fortunate children back in Liberia. And that's how I came to the States this time. And while coming, he said, well, there's an invitation to speak at the Pepperdine University. Are you willing to do so? And I said, well, 
wherever I can talk to anyone to at least help anybody in any way, I'm willing to do so. So I hope I will say something today that will be meaningful to somebody to help you become a better leader. Uh, when I have two minutes left, just show me peace and I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, Liberia is a very tiny country on the west coast of Africa, uh, bounded by Guinea, Sierra Leone, and uh, the Ivory Coast. So the, the, if you look at Liberia there being so tiny, uh, sorry, this is not, right on top of us, where Guinea is, just at the border, there is where the disease actually started. And spread from there to Sierra Leone, you realize that half of our borderland is what Sierra Leone and Guinea is covering. So the, and there's a lot of uh, intermarriages between Liberians and Guinea, and uh, trade between all three countries. So it was difficult for the disease to remain in those two countries without coming to Liberia. The Ebola virus disease began in December 2003. In March 22, 2014, uh, the disease was in the northern part of Liberia in Lofa County. And over 28,000 cases were reported in the three countries. But in Liberia alone, we had uh, between four to 5,000 deaths just between March 2014 to April 15, April 2015. So just in barely a year and one month, we had so many deaths from such a daily disease. Liberia infrastructure was uh, vulnerable to many types of diseases. We had insufficient and unstable infrastructure and equipment. I mean, many of the institutions in Liberia at that time never had good diagnostic capability. Even gloves in many of the hospitals were not available. And people, nurses were, or health workers were using one glove on more than one patient because of its inavailability. And that's the situation we found ourselves in before the outbreak. Very weak health, and then poor quality of health care. We had inadequate and poor, poorly motivated health workers. There's no insurance scheme. The salary scale, very poor. In fact, in Liberia, doctors made very less than the uh, accountant, lawyers, and public health technician. If you are a clinician, you are the least paid among the doctors. That's the situation we, we had. And come to talk about nurses, it was uh, even worse. Liberia has a, it's a small country with about 11, 111,000 square kilometer with a very small population between 3.5 to 4 million people. We have five, 15 counties and 16 ethnic groups. And uh, we had just emerged from a bloody civil war where so many persons had died for 14 years we had that war, and we're just trying to recover and rebuild our health infrastructure when all went wrong. According to the Ministry of Health in Liberia, 29% of Liberians lack access to health facility within five kilometer distance. And then 65% of households tend to walk to health facility. 26% of health facility have no sound structure. Many of them are made from dyed brick or zinc. Yes, yeah, so you don't have a solid structure for most of those facilities. 45% do not have primary power source. No running water, no electricity in most of those facilities. There are some of them that get shut down and don't uh, deliver care at night because of either no fuel for the generator uh, they just can't afford. For the three percent do not have functional, I think this number is underestimated. I think I would think 75 percent never had incinerator at the time of the outbreak, or a proper waste management in most of the institution. Most require uh, when the outbreak came, we had to pre make uh, extension for isolation or pro provide triage. So none of such things existed in any hospital. As I even speak today, I, I can count only one institution in Liberia 
with an intensive care unit, the entire country, I think one that I know of. Most have very weak infection prevention control system. We're all lacking. Just to give you an idea of what, where we were before the outbreak. Then came March 28, uh, during one of our regular doctor's meeting, when I was now appointed as medical director, that I put on the agenda, I had on the, on the agenda item, Ebola. So we decided to first discuss it. So I had it there then. Chairing the meeting, we decided to create a holding unit at the hospital so that if we had anyone turning out positive or any of our staff being positive, we have them kept there until we can have them transferred to whatever treatment unit would be set up by the government. And so we concluded that um, let's have the chapel set up because we never had, we spoke with the administrator, there was no funding to build a tent. And the only isolated structure on campus was the chapel. So we chose to use it. And the first challenge was who will inform the staff that we, as administrators, have agreed to use the chapel. You say, uh, I'm medical director, you have to tell your staff. So I went on the Monday morning and told the staff, we had a meeting, and we know this is not going to sound good, but uh, we decided that beginning next week, we all worship in the auditorium, and the chapel would now be turned over to be restructured as an absolute unit for Ebola, and was grumbling. <laughs> Yes, you know, so I uh, said, so fine. At the end, while walking through the corridor, people say all kinds of things now. And that is where your position as a leader counts. How are you going to absorb the same from others? Are you going to react immediately or become a shock absorber? And so that's what I chose to be. Absorb what they say. Because one thing, people were not looking in the future. When we held the meeting, we looked at the rapidity at which the disease spread in Guinea. In no time, it came from the rural part to the capital. In no time, it was in Sierra Leone. And people felt, because it was not in Liberia, we should fold our hands. We said, no. It will come. The fact that refugees were in Liberia before from Sierra Leone and went back home and left some of their relatives in Liberia, they could come back. So those were the thoughts, those were the things we discussed before thinking about having the chapel set up. So with all that people had to say, I kept quiet. One nurse looked at me and said, you've come back from studying and you've joined these white people <laughs> to kill us. That's why you decided to take our chapel. Because most of the 50% uh, of the leadership were all missionary doctors from the US. And but they were not seeing ahead, and you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't get angry with them. So uh, training became an issue. How would we train the staff? Then we, there was no training material. We went to the net, began to look at what has been done in the past, and then formulated our own training calendar, adapted it to our setting. And so that's how we started training. And then I decided to make it mandatory that all of the staff in the institution got trained. So irrespective of your position, the janitor, cleaner, sweeper, whoever you were, was a must that you got trained. And one thing I did was I went up first to get trained. And that's one of the strengths we had. We tried to lead by example because people were already afraid. And if you don't uh, show them the way forward, they don't tend to follow. So I can't say, everyone get trained, and then I'm there doing surgery and don't want to be part of the training. Okay, but when they realized the medical director himself showed up and started going through the uh, protective gear and how to put it on, how to do donny and dolphin, then say, okay, then we all can go through. So you, we, we, leading by example was one of our uh, strengths during the outbreak. So there I am, and they're trying to put on 
Uh, we, we, we never had the protective, the formal protective gear to use at that time for training. But as a sergeant, sterility was our primary map we used in the OR. And so we, if we, we decided to show, demonstrate how we could safely, we safely put on our uh, OR gowns without getting our patient infected, and then told them about how you must be faithful and report any wrong while working in the OR. Because you can't uh, be, say, putting on your uh, gown and then your hand hit against an object and no one saw you. You kept quiet. You don't say that in the OR. You must be faithful enough to say, oh, I'm contaminated and allow yourself to scrub out, even if a man going to redress and come back. And so that's the same thing we try to educate uh, the worker about as we're working with these patients. That you can, you have to be faithful at all costs. So in some instances, we, we never had anything to, when there was no food cover, we had to go out, purchase plastic bag, and start using it. If you look there, there's a hood. We never had hood available when I was asked to go on the 19th of June. And so I just took other uh, protective gear that we, that we were not using and fractioned it as a hood. And when they saw me doing it, they took fraction and used it as a hood, and we went in. If I said there's no hood, so we sat down, the patients are there, who care for them? So, uh, and there was no time to have meeting. Most of the time, you just have to make decision as we went ahead. Uh, Dr. Debbie, Dr. Brindley, and Finn Castle were our first three uh, doctors who started working at the chapel when we turned it. And then the boy there is called Jabba. He was the first survivor out of the first 45 patients. So we had one survivor when we had so many patients the first time. And that was, uh, on the other side, we have Nancy. She's waving there. She's one of those that got infected in Liberia together with Ken. Uh, they were the two that got infected and had to leave later on. Uh, at that point, I was asked, uh, my role was to remain in the hospital, keep attending to patients with hypertension and other surgical needs with the other uh, local doctor. Um, we, 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 however, uh, we realized a few things that were not true about the disease. One, that once you were working in the chapel, in the ETU, you should have nothing to do with the hospital because you could have cross-infection from the treatment unit into the hospital. And so I was told to remain only in the hospital. Don't go to the unit. And the doctors that were working in the unit were told not to come back to the hospital. But later on, we realized that, that that was not true. If you actually exhibited good uh, infection control method, and I heard to the details of it, you can walk in the unit safely, disrobe yourself, and go back to the hospital and offer services. You're not sick. You're not carrying infected material into the hospital. Why can't you walk there? That's the question I kept asking people. And it made it even worse when others were not willing to work in the hospital. And so what should I do? Allow those that are coming for surgical care to die because I've been into the unit? Of course not. So we said, no, we can't, we can't allow that to happen. And a couple of my workers also work in the unit and also work in the hospital because they were the only one I could rely on, especially the OR technicians. The few of them are recruited to work in the unit also come back to the hospital and were bold enough to scrub with me and to go ahead and do surgery. And confidence and boldness was another thing we did look for in our patient, in our worker. If you're not bold enough, we're not willing to get you on our team because we don't want fear and fright to cause you to infect us. Staff recruitment was another challenging thing. Okay, we tried to talk to the nurses when it all started on the 12th of June, and many of them who were trained later said to me, I'm sorry, we can't walk, we can't, we can't go to the unit. Louise was one of those, the lady standing there with me. When I told her that night, she said, my head is hurting. I said, no, Louise, I mean, it can't be. I went to the other. Uh, the physician assistant, he said, look, I can do anything for you, Dr. Brian, including washing your clothes, doing anything for you at the house. But to go into the unit, forget it. <laughs> and then I decided now, 
perhaps I should use force, use my position. So I went back to them. Okay, if you don't go to work in the unit tonight, consider yourself dismissed. And I'm going to give you a letter of dismissal tomorrow. So I'm using my authority. But I was shocked when one of when Louis came back to me and said, no, 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 no. Don't use your strength, your energy to go and write a letter of dismissal. I'll bring my resignation to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> then I knew we had a problem. <laughs> yeah, I had a problem. So I gave Dr. Brenly a call. I said, I have a problem. You're getting dressed to come and go to the unit, but I can't get any dress to work with you. And I, gave, I told him what was happening. And I told the PA, to, you must work. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. He said, then Brenly called me and said, look, I think we need to use another strategy. So we call them to talk to them one on one, give them reason why they should go. So Brenda took Louis in the corner. I don't know how he discussed with her. She agreed that night to go. And I went to the OR, I recruited another gentleman, and he came and joined the team. And they went to take care of those patients that night. The next day, when I greeted Louis, she just took at me. <laughs> For two weeks, we could not greet one another. Yeah, we passed, and that was it. Then the next thing we decided to do, was to provide incentive, at some, maybe to double their salary. So I went to the ministry, the Minister of Health and asked her, if you can provide extra incentives for these people, maybe they will agree. So I came back and told them, look, we want to recruit 14 persons, and the ministry, as I said, they will do this. And still people walk away. Say, should I go and die for $200, go and die for $400? My life worth more than four hundred dollars, so they refused. And so the next thing we taught on doing was to persuade them, make them to see reason for wanting to work. And so I don't know where these ideas came from, but I went and told them, "Look, this is our country. We are at war. If we, the militant who should go to the front line now and fight, don't go and fight, we don't expect the accountant to go there." We don't expect the soldiers to attend to these people. We don't expect the police. It's our fight as health worker. And we would know it better than the other people. And in fact, it's your country you're fighting for. We don't expect people to come from elsewhere and come and do the fight for us. We don't expect that. And while talking to them, a couple of them begin to see reason. So we don't have the money to pay you for whatever you're going to do. And Gradually, he started responding. So since I never knew the audience I spoke to, I never knew how many persons in the audience re re accepted my message, I went to the bulletin, typed out, put it there, and said, whoever is willing to join us in this fight, write your name on this. And then I forgot it. Before the end of the day, I saw four names. I said, fine. The following day, it increased to 10. Within three days, we have 14 persons already, voluntary, writing their name, and stood up to fight. And that's how we uh, recruited our staff. Uh, by the 12th, <laughs> thank you. By the 12th of June, the first two patients came, and uh, we admitted them by the 20th of June. We were now waiting for one patient to die, to replace that one, to have another person admitted. So whenever the minister called, oh, we think we have additional patients at SYZ Hospital. We want to transfer them to your place. Now I said, no space. Hold on. If any of the individual in there died, then I will give you a call. And so that's the situation we had. And so the next thought was, should we sit down and people continue to die? No. We then went and moved on to, uh, went there and took, our, took the kitchen. When, when we have just built the new kitchen and the new laundry for the new hospital we're about to move to. And then in our one of our meetings, we said, how can we transform the kitchen and the laundry and increase the bare occupancy, then sit down and keep seeing no space? So we moved across the street to the kitchen and the laundry, which was now referred to as E other way A2. And then the bare occupancy increased to 20. But before we could know it, by the end of July, 
we have more than 20 patients coming. So our outpatient department was just next to it. So we annexed that and increased it to 50. But then the Ministry of Health now was, dipping, was now constructing a new treatment unit. And uh, the doctors of our border were now constructing a 250 bed unit. So that gave us a little bit of relief with the 50 bed uh, occupancy. And then uh, we had to change a few po um, uh, policy, come up with a few policies when it came to how to care for patients. What we read in the book said, you don't touch the patient. You give three feet distance away, give them oral rehydration, let them consume that, and while they're doing that, don't give them any bare bath because you could get infected. But then I had to create means of ensuring that we took care of these people. One, we never had confidence in the uh, donated items that we're receiving, those protective gear. Were there any that were porous? We never knew. We're not a manufacturer. So we decided to test, at, at, I mean, to, to, to prove that these things were okay. We tried to put water, fluid in it and held it in front of the staff. If water seeped out of that, then we're not going to go to the restroom with it. But if we uh, did it and no fluid seeped through it, then we used that in the restroom. Because even if you have spillage of fluid on you, there's a less chance of it getting on your body. And that helped to build their confidence. Okay, you just had to come up with something to. So we tried to uh, do away with, with that. And because people kept dying, I had together with two of the physician assistants sat down and decided to just read at random on RNA virus. Whatever is used to help individual with RNA virus, let's look it up. You know, begin to look at the impact of chloroquine, looking at and bacteria as an opportunistic infection thing, looking at uh, one immunity, once it's built up, uh, your body will be able to fight back. And so we prepare our own treatment protocol. One of the nurses uh, by the name of Barbara, uh, okay, I will show you Barbara later, then came down with the disease and whatever protocol or empirical thing we put together, we started with Barbara. And she kept asking me, why is it that my drug are more than what you're giving to other people? And it was hard to say, what if Barbara had died from what I was giving her? I would have would my, held myself responsible. But as God will have it, Barbara developed subcontinental hemorrhage, but later on, began to recover. Then I called the team. I said, hmm, I see me a difference in Barbara. Maybe something is happening. I don't have the proof, but something is happening. And then there was another medical doctor in the unit as well. He too began to change after we gave it to him. So from there, we sat down and decided that this is our protocol for our unit. We don't want to know what WHO is saying or what whoever is saying. This is our Liberian unit, and we will go by this method of treatment. And so we begin to use it for all of the patients. Then the number of recovery gradually begin to increase. From those two individuals, we went to four, then eight, then 12, and 20, and just begin to increase on an exponential basis. And we just uh, had a lot of jubilation whenever that happened. That is Barbara over there. Uh, after our missionary colleague left the country, Barbara got infected around the 27th of July. And then um, by the 28th, I got her admitted into the unit. And all of the staff that were working in the unit pulled out and chose not to work again because they never knew how Ken and Nancy got infected. They said, until I could explain to them how it happened, they too feel perhaps we are already infected. So I said, yes, yeah, good. You have a very good reason. I'm not going to argue. For those of you that are willing to go home and observe yourself, in that general meeting, I told them, you can go home. Just give me your telephone number so that I call you every day to know how you're doing. For those of you who feel confidence to remain with me in the fight, still, let's go ahead. It was at that time I decided to shut down the hospital because I felt we have to re-strategize and see how we can take a different approach on what was happening. How can I continue in the hospital and at the same time work in the unit was a challenge. But after that meeting, we then uh, reopened the hospital by August 8th. Now, one challenge we had at that time was uh, 
catering to other disease entity other than Ebola. A lot of people die from malaria, especially, or ruptured uterus where here, there, you know. People have strangulated hernia that no one could attend to. At one time, a gentleman came with strangulated umbilical hernia in a rupture, and he had his uh, toward tie on it. That's not Ebola. I had to operate him. This woman was uh, called me by four in the morning, and I had to uh, do delivery for her in an ambulance because all of the hospital had rejected her. And the child there, mom came, was, she had had two previous cesarean sections and came in labor. And the question was, do we wait for an Ebola test in eight hours later? And she was in active labor. So we said, no, just have to be safe and operate. We operated her. The child turned out being Ebola positive, and the mom was positive as well. But we did over 200 cesarean sections during that period. And only four turned out having Ebola. None of us got infected. If we had trained everybody away, be more chaotic then. So we felt, I mean, people criticize us for operating on individuals that have Ebola, but we saved life. So that did not move us. Mm. We were only fighting to be uh, on the safe side. My time is almost over. And, um, this is how we, we had about 232 survivors, and the total death to Ebola in our unit was 446. <laughs> and the most interesting thing was none of our staff ever got infected after we took over. No one in the hospital and no one at the unit. Uh, we changed the survival rate from 10% to 60 to 75 percent at our unit, and then improve the case fertility being coming down to 49.1 percent at our unit. And so uh, there were times whenever they went to pick people up from the environment, they always said, take us to Dr. Brown unit. Take us to Dr. Brown unit. Because they were now, it was now changed from once you got Ebola, you will die. They now begin to air a new information on the radio. If you've got Ebola and you turn out sooner, you may live. Or if you got to the hospital on time, you could live. And that changed the scenario because people now left the environment and decided to come. Because initially, Ebola was a death sentence. So even going to the hospital was useless because you would die anyway. So people chose not to come to the hospital at all. Um, so we had to do surgery and other things, but um, that helped. This is a couple of the survivors. That's Barbara over there on the day we're discharging her, and that is Dr. Arale next to me. Dr. Paps was one of the doctors I recruited to help me uh, attend to the patients later. These are all survivors. Uh, we certificated them on the day of discharge because uh, to show that they had recovered. And this was another challenging thing because when they went back home, they are Either they are, everything in the home were destroyed or burned, and they were told, some home told them not to come back because uh, they were infected with the disease. So to show that, I mean, to help reduce the stigmatization in the community, we went on radio, and then I called a television crew, and on the day of discharge, I would give the certificate and shook their hand with my bare hand. I say, if I can shake this guy hand with my bare hand, they don't pose any danger to you. And at one point, one of the journalists asked me, are you sure these guys are safe to live with us? And I said, right now, I can hug him, but I can't hug you because I don't know your status. <laughs> but he's lived with me. Yes, I don't know your status, so I can't hug you. Yeah, so for, yeah, for him, it was surprising. But, but that was the fact I was telling him. And so I told him, there's no need of rejecting these people. No need. I mean, we were burning everything. If they came into the unit with any belonging, we burn it, including your passport, money, anything. And most of the people were poor. On one occasion, one of the ladies I was discharging, I saw her swelling on her jaw. But when she was in the unit and I was attending to her, there was no swelling. So I asked, well, how? I mean, attending to you, there was no swelling on your mouth. When I asked her to open her mouth, she had wrapped one in another U.S. and hid it there. Because she felt if we had seen it before, we would have taken it from her and destroyed it. So I had to tell her, give it to me. I will give you a 20 back. 
Yes. And then I went back to tell them, if you have money, you came here with money, give it to me at a mission so I can take care of the money. But no one will destroy your money. And I developed a means, putting it in the plastic, tying it, and threw it on top of the roof of the building, allowed the sun to shine on it. At the end of the day, Ebola will not live on it. So at the time of discharge, I give you your money. You have to find a way. Yes. Instead of taking it and burning it, destroying it. Yes. But these people never have money. There's a lady that came with 9,000 Liberian data. Should I burn it? No. I mean, she survived. She wanted that money to start life. But we're burning passport, burning everything. But when I noticed that, I said, no, we need to find another means of saving these people things. Their land deed, their passport, and it meant things to them. And so that's how we went about uh, emergency surgery. We did about 400 between June to December. 50% of them were Ebola related, and we kept doing uh, hospital care. Today, here the way hospital is still there, we do variety of surgery, stay each, uh, offering medical care. And um, I will say thank you. With the utmost desire to save life, you can surely do wonders. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, one of the things you said um, was what it took to get other people involved. It, it sort of reminded me of uh, uh, about 35 years ago with the uh, onset of AIDS in this country and how difficult it was to get people to uh, be willing to treat the patients and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, so what was it about you that you were willing to do that? I mean, I saw that you brought other people along, but what was it about you or your upbringing that let you take this um, along? Uh, well, um, I think first, uh, whatever profession you find yourself in, you have to first have passion for that profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you uh, just enter it because uh, whatever financial gain you want to get, if it's not forthcoming, you don't tend to work. And so my primary goal of becoming a medical doctor was help save life. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, entering medical school when I was accepted, the dean later told me, your response to one of the questions that you decide to come because you want to help save life is what got you to pass. And I mm -hmm. said, wow. And because I feel individually I can't save life, but by the grace of God, he can provide the knowledge and what have you to save life. So my, I got to a point where I felt, what kind of disease is this that? Everyone continued to die, 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 die. I mean, it, was, it wasn't making sense. I mean, mm -hmm. someone just have to live. And I'd say, if we don't do something, we'll keep dying, keep dying. And I remember in one interview, I said, library would no longer exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, concerning the radar. Which, so first of all, personally, I had the passion and the desire to, to save life at all costs. Yeah, so you were, you, you were quoted as saying that you thought that uh, if you do nothing, this disease is going to overrun sure. Liberia and, and you won't have a, a, a country left. So what gave you these different ideas to stop the rapid spread of this disease? Well, uh, actually, these ideas just came out as, <laughs> as, as, we, as, we, as we went ahead because there was no time, at many times there was no time to call administrative meeting to decide and discuss issue before going ahead. It was almost like a, in a war front. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, uh, when some of my colleagues were getting angry with uh, some of the staff for not wanting to join, I gave them a scenario. I said, look, we are all civilians. If you were asked now to stand there and then give you a bulletproof jacket, I said, wear it, fine. And I can, Mama Sodia, I said, trust me, that bullet, I will take the gun, fire at you, and the bullet is not going to pass through that jacket to hit you. You have to be a man with guts to stand there and allow somebody to point a gun at you and fire. So I told them that's the same scenario was happening. So you have to build up their confidence to accept the reality before going in. So you have to first put on the, the protective gear, go in there, come back safe, and let them see you doing it before you, but initially I thought I could use my position as medical director, but I realized that was the wrong thing. So persuasion is what we use most of the time to persuade them to see reason to fight for the country. Do you think of yourself as a change leader? A leader 
of change. Impact change. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's how my that's how my lifestyle has been. Uh, I became president for the Liberia Medical and Dental Association. I mean, the Liberia Medical and Dental Student Association in Liberia when I was at the medical school and headed the school as president. And we impacted change when the students never had any means to mm -hmm. feed themselves. Right. We had to start for feeding, for, to, to feed the student at the school right. and I became community leader at one point, provided wells and other things for the community to help change their right. life. I mean, that's my... Yeah. So Idris Elba said that in, in the face of skepticism and misunderstanding, you trained and you taught and you treated waves of people. Yeah. I, I'm curious what your wife had to say about this. Uh, yes, and, my, uh, my how your family <laughs> dealt with. My wife, when uh, Brinley and others were attending to patients in the unit, she often said to me, "Do not enter the unit." Mm -hmm. I said, "Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I will not enter the unit." Mm -hmm. And then I kept saying that until when they left and there was no one to lead a group and I chose to go there, I never told her. So it took approximately 10 days or more before she discovered. The very first day I stopped my daughter from coming to embrace me mm -hmm. when I returned from work because that's one thing she often did, rain and I'll grab her and swing her around. Mm -hmm. But I told her, no, 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 we can't do this anymore. The next thing I did was I called a meeting in the house and educated them on Ebola. Mm -hmm. How it spread, what the signs and symptoms are, how you can prevent it, and educated my children in the house. Mm -hmm. And I often say that to the staff. You can come here and we give you good education on prevention of Ebola and you don't go back home and educate your family member. Not educating you to keep it to yourself. But go back, educate them so that they do to prevent themselves from getting the disease, okay? And my wife, once upon a time, uh, saw my, she was packing my clothes for laundry, and she saw my boxer, and mm -hmm. it has changed color because of the bleach they were spraying on me. It passed through the scrub and got on my boxer, and the boxer color changed. <laughs> so, 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 so she called my attention, hey, what is this? <laughs> Look at the second box, so the color has changed also. Eh? So, uh, I was pushed against the wall and I had no option but to confess. <laughs> yeah, I had no option but to confess and say, Look, I have entered the unit and uh, I had no option. Sorry, I never told you, but I've been there for more than a week. More than a week? Said, yes, more than a week. And she sat for long and said, well, it's like I can't change you. Since this is what you like, continue. But be careful. That's what she said. And I said, OK. Mm -hmm. So she was there as a primary prayer partner, kept praying. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't easy. I mean, yeah. there, were, there were some tough times where I remember one night, let me share this story with you, uh, we're in bed. And uh, I was perspiring, sweating excessively. I never knew why I was sweating so excessively. And I was between, I got up and kept thinking in my mind, what's happening? Am I infected already? Or what? Then while sleeping, my wife was at the other edge of the bed, and I was at the other edge because we don't want to touch one another. Then sleeping, she put her hand on me. And I shut my hand. She said, why are you pushing my hand? What's happening? I said, look, didn't you know I'm sweating? I could be infected. I don't want you to touch me. And so what? And I said, I'm, I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. I know it I'll push, but I mean, this yeah. kind of thing did happen. I mean, yeah. People don't know about many things that happen behind the scene. Before I open it up for a couple of questions from the audience, can you tell us a little bit about the work you're doing now with Case Western Reserve and others in the research area? Case Western Reserve? Yeah, in the research area that you're doing? Uh, no, I'm, I've been working with a group called Clinical Research Management. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think they are the, at the Case Western Reserve. We started off with uh, doing convalescent plasma 
to see, to determine its effectiveness in treating uh, Ebola patients. So since we were one of the first group to start putting out a huge number of patients, we, we brought in this uh, vein where we were able to extract plasma from the survivor and, and we administer it to them. Mm -hmm. But by the time we had the entire research set up to get started, to get RRB approval, to get the government approval, it was almost late. So mm -hmm. by December 15, we started, we had only six patients. Mm -hmm. So we never had many patients to really conclude. If we, and we started this process in September, but all of the bureaucracy to get things shipped to Liberia and get things done, it was challenging. But they are coming in also help us in getting, being able to do chemistry for our patients because when we started that, uh, the start machines that were brought in, we decided to use it not only for uh, patients that were enrolled into the study, but for any other patient. Mm -hmm. And then we begin to see a big difference in terms of what was responsible for the patient's death. Okay, today we are doing longitudinal zero uh, compression study with the survivor, mm -hmm. where we are studying their body secretion to be specific semen and uh, uh, vaginal secretion and uh, analyzing them to see how long the viral persists the in yeah. this body fluid before they fade away mm -hmm. after recovery. Because I remember there was one patient, he's an Indian, was admitted into my unit and then we, he recovered and we discharged him. But uh, two months after, he went to India and when he got at the airport, he declared, he was rejoicing for what has happened to him and told them, oh, I was in Dr. Brown, you then I recovered from the Ebola. I said, okay. So they grabbed him and quarantined him. <laughs> 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 when, they, when they went to do a semen analysis, it was still positive. Two months after. Mm. Yeah, that was when I said, then we need to do a study yeah. because whatever was existing in literature might not be true. He, and he continued for like 110 days before he became negative mm. without any further treatment, but just quarantine, giving him all of vitamin supplements, and he was okay. What, what gave you the idea to take patients who were recovering or not showing any symptoms after their acute phase to actually use them to help uh, care for other patients? We were looking at their presenting science symptoms. So if you came into the unit, uh, your initial science symptoms were recorded. It has another uh, funny thing about the uh, treatment that people don't know. We never had, uh, it was difficult to have a chart in there and write. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started off initially by having assessed patient A. You go to the window and then shout it. Patient A, vital sign, temperature is recorded outside by somebody else. Continue to have blood as two and subconscious time by human hemorrhage pressing, weakness, give you a skill, and then went back to the next patient. Mm -hmm. We progressed from that to having the chest in, write on it, wrote on it, and then I took the camera, took the picture, and then, but uh, we took the digital camera, I mean, took the phone rather, not camera, took the phone, put in a zip plastic, and see the zip plastic up and took it with me. So we now wrote on the chart, and then we take the phone, took the picture, and then move on. That made her to walk even faster mm. than going to shout out. And then once you got out, took the zip plastic, dip it in a bleach water, and then go back open it, and someone reached out for the camera, for the phone. We're not infecting anyone. Mm. And we continue to use the phone, and no mm. one got infected. So it's just hard to. Yeah, very creative, just very hard to genius. come up with something to move ahead. Yeah, very courageous as yeah. well. Yeah. What was it like uh, for you to be named Time Magazine's uh, person? Uh, I, it, was, it was a shock. I, I mean, it was something I never anticipated. I really thought all I felt I was doing was doing the best I can to help my fellow Liberians. That's what I thought I was, that's all I was doing. So uh, the lady who did it, she was really persistent. That's how she managed to gather information from me because she came on Monday, I remember, and I turned her down, said, I don't have time for her to sit and talk. So she left, came back Tuesday, 
I said, look, you journalists are pissed. <laughs> Not leave me alone. I have, I have no work to do. I don't have time to sit. And she said, only 15 minutes. And I didn't want to because the other journalists that I came earlier will tell you 10 minutes, but it will carry you through 45 minutes to an hour. No, no, I don't. I can never listen to any journalist who will say, only 10 minutes. This is, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> so she came back the third day. I mean, came back the second day. I said, okay, tomorrow, 2 o'clock. And I thought I had discouraged her. But the next day, 2 o'clock, she was sitting, waiting. When I was getting dressed to go into the unit, then I saw her out there taking picture. Then she called, can I take your picture, please? Now, look. That's when she took the picture that she put on the magazine. So, yeah, I, I, <laughs> yes, that, yeah, that's when she took that picture. Yes. But I never noticed what she was doing. I feel, then that's how I finally went back to the chapel because we were no longer using the chapel. She went and sat in the chapel and then she conducted her interview for about an hour, asking one thing to another. But uh, when they finally declared me uh, to be on the magazine, at that entire week, for like five days, I had not checked my box, and then I think they wrote me to inform me. And then a friend of mine called me from Britain. He said, congratulations. I said, for what? He said, oh, you time I got to me on the I said, you kidding, it can't be true. <laughs> he said, no, I'm telling you. Then I received a call from her from South Africa, and she said, when was the last time you checked your, your email? I said, I don't, I've not checked my box for over five days. So check, check, check. And when I went to look, I saw it. That's when I called my wife and said, I don't know. Yeah. But to answer your previous question, what's the sign and symptoms we look at? Those were the two things. History, sign and symptoms were the two things we used to manage our patient because there was no diagnostic capability, no way to do any investigation. So as your symptoms improve, you stop vomiting, stop having fever, if you have bloody diarrhea and you stop having it, then we know you are on your way to recovery. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we notice, people tend to develop a kind of voracious appetite once they are recovering. Mm -hmm. Yes, they lost their appetite initially, but once you begin to, we brought food, and we don't have to feed you anymore, you begin to eat, then we know. And the next thing I did was, I brought in a satellite television in my unit, and we put it there and then begin to scream movie. So if you're able to leave your bed, and him and sat there to watch movie, you say, okay, this man is on his way to recovery. Mm -hmm. They'll be very sick. <laughs> you don't leave your bed and come to sit there. <laughs> yes, so, they, so, yeah, so we just had to, and once, yeah, once you were doing that, then we begin to look at you and say, okay, we keep our eye on this one. And once that happened between uh, 10 to 14 days of admission, and no symptom, then we collect specimen and send it to CDC for the first investigation. If it came back negative, we kept it for an additional three to five days and repeated. If we repeated the second time and you're still negative, then we declare you a survivor. Mm. Yeah, excellent. Let's open it up. I, I know we're kind of pushing up against the time here, but I want to give uh, the audience a chance. There in the back, we can't hear you, so take uh, the microphone, please. I have a question about um, how, since um, what you've done for the Ebola virus, how are, you, how are doctors working with the government to um, talk and educate uh, the public about preventative measures when these kinds of things start to arise, when you know, medical emergencies are, arise? Uh, the government of Liberia has, has put together what they call uh, building up a resilient health system. And so one thing I realized, the first uh, thought about doing is to first have someone trained in infectious disease, because there have been no one trained in infectious disease in Liberia, no uh, one in such, such specialty. Uh, one of the doctors we, we recruited has been trained already. He was sent to Britain and he's back. So it's now being, it's now being used to see how we can help the Ministry of Health to uh, ensure that the viral health uh, sectors ad adapt good uh, infection prevention protocol that will be sustainable. So that's another thing, uh, teaching the people to do one thing and ensuring that they continue to adhere to that uh, measure. For our hospital, we still continue to do triage, if not change. 
and we still want to keep our eyes on one another to make sure you are doing the right thing. Thank you. Someone else? Can we have a... Uh, there was a slide I had that we go now to the new hospital, the new site, and interestingly, the kitchen and the laundry are now being used for that internal purpose. So, <laughs> yes, so we're doing laundry there now. In the, in the kitchen, we are preparing food, and they now the, the interesting thing, they have a table there for doctors to go there and have lunch, but I've never been there. Yeah, I went there once, and I have memories from the past. Because I could just look and saw where Barbara was admitted and where this other person was. And so I just walked away and never went back. Yeah. In the back? Be sure to get the microphone, because it's hard to hear you up here. Great work, my brother. Thank you. Good. Appreciate that. Um, my question is, what's the biggest ask what how can we help you how can we help your country and what's the biggest ask uh, for the new hospital um, or the biggest need we have we have we have numerous need one of the things that brought me to the US okay let me start with that is the need to educate the least fortunate Liberians there are children in villages that still need education if others had not helped me, I'm, I, I grew up in a slum, then I won't be where I am today. And so one of the things is education for younger Liberians. And so that's why I joined this uh, they fight with the new dimension of hope to support them in their effort in having a school constructed to cater to the younger ones. We still have problem in the hospital relate, as it relate to uh, diagnostic capability. Still in our in Liberia, perhaps only one hospital is capable of doing cultural insensitivity. We don't, have, we have not come to that point. We still fight, still uh, don't have, uh, like I was sharing with the other, we don't have thing like mesh to do skin graft, so you have the skill to do it. But there's no measure, so I'm using razor blade to harvest this, this graft, that's what we're doing. You have kids with uh, esophageal stricture, and you can find uh, a gastrostomy tube, so you have to use Foley catheter to improvise in order to save their life. I mean, uh, we, we just need any possible medical uh, equipment or supply you can give us, we will take it. But one dying need we have is uh, being able to train others in various medical subspecialty so that uh, we we'll be able to uh, relieve the burden on others. I think, for example, um, one of the few surgeons in the country, but I found myself in a country where there is no urologist. So I end up doing prostatectomy, doing urethroplasty as a general surgeon. There's no plastic surgeon. So I end up doing skin graft, and end up doing uh, and contractual release and other things. No orthopedic surgeon. There's something I'll show you there. We have one orthopedic surgeon. He's already retiring. So I found myself doing long bone fracture repair and inputting intramedullary sand oil and other things. And no endocrinology, so I found myself doing mastectomy, tarodectomy. Because, but if we have many persons trained, and I won't be burdened by those things. There's no pediatric surgeon anywhere, so I have to do all of the possible pediatric surgery that come my way to help, and that's the beauty of the program on which I was trained, the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeon. The training was intended to equip you with all possible surgical skills, so that when you go back to your country, you'll be able to deliver services in the best way possible. Yeah, but human resource development is a dying need in Liberia. Okay, we, we don't have any anesthesiologists. And it was shocking I went to 
uh, Atlanta and visited uh, one of the hospitals. Look on the bulletin, there were 20 anesthesiologists. And see, I said, are they all, I mean, you have 20 anesthesiologists here? And they said, no, that's just the list for today on shift. I said, wow, <laughs> we don't have one, and you have 20 on shift today. <laughs> but that's, that's how it is. And, so you've traveled a long way to be here, and I know you've been to other places in, in this country as well, and you're continuing on uh, tomorrow. What's the one message you really hope our audience walks out with tonight <laughs> from your story? One message. Uh, I, I think I, um, in the midst of crisis, what we need to know is know the truth about the disease entity, and if you know the truth and abide by the, I mean, when I talk about truth, I mean scientific facts about the mm -hmm. disease. And once you adhere to it, there's no need of being afraid. Especially with Ebola, uh, when it started, if I sat with you here today, and it turned out that I begin to show signs and symptoms tomorrow, they will burn this place. It will come and destroy everything here. If you knew the facts about the disease, there's no need to panic. Okay, and uh, for most of you that want to be leaders, I learned in this place, lead by example. Don't just be a dictator and say, do, 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 do. But you can't show, I mean, you are not willing to do it yourself. If you can't do it, don't ask others to do it. Yes, you must be willing to lead by example in the midst of crisis. Yeah. Outstanding. It, it has been my distinct honor to have this conversation with you and to hear you tonight and share your story with all of us. I think our world's very lucky to have you and have people like you and your colleagues that really stepped up to, to address this issue and help shape the future for humanity. Yeah, thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you.